Hi, everybody. My name is Ivan Trukic, and I'll be talking about uh, C++ and how linear types can save the API in C++. Uh, just a short intro about me. I'm a KDAB uh, senior software engineer. Uh, I've been a KD developer for more than a decade, and I wrote a book on functional programming in C++. So I start all, the, all of my presentations with a really nice quote by Phil Vadla. I make your code readable, pretend that the next person who looks at your code is a psychopath, and they know where you live. So Phil Vadla, a really important figure in what the functional programming world, and the concept of linear types that we will be talking about is something that he came up with a long time ago, but it's still not really widely used in any programming language. So let's start with uh, some kind of an introduction. Uh, in C++ and in similar programming languages, we usually have state that is mutable. So we have a rogue, and if we want to change something, we just call a setter, and we get a rogue that has something changed in it. In pure functional programming, the things are a little bit different because we don't have the possibility to change the data once once it's created. So instead of changing the current world, we always need to create a new, slightly changed world from the current one and then just use that changed world. Uh, we, each action that we perform, we are going to create another world and another world and another world. And this can be a little bit problematic because if we always create new worlds, it's going to be expensive. And in functional languages, we usually have uh, data structures that optimize for this, so persistent data structures. Uh, but still, it gives some somewhat of an, uh, of an overhead. It's really cool to have the possibility to uh, access the old states. And if we give a world to somebody and change our copy, that the original world hasn't changed. But usually, we just live in a single world. So we don't care about the previous worlds. We don't care about the alternative possible world worlds. We just need the current one. And that's where linear types uh, come into play. So in uh, Philip Rodler's paper called Linear Types Can Change the World, he defined linear types as uh, values belonging to a linear type must be used exactly once. Like the world, they can be duplicated or destroyed. Such values require no reference counting or garbage collection. This means that if we want to change the world, even if we are in a pure functional programming language, we can actually change the world uh, pretending that we have created the new one and destroyed the old one because if a value is going to be used exactly once, then the old world will never be used again. And that's a really uh, nice way to implement mutability in functional programming languages. And the coolest thing, at least in my opinion, about this paper is the title, Linear Types Can Change the World, because uh, it kind of has two meanings. One meaning is that the linear type is extremely important as a concept. And the second one is that it actually can change the world in mutable uh, impure functional programming languages. Now the question is, okay, this is uh, functional programming. Why do we care about it in languages like C++? In C++, we have something called RAII, which means that as soon as we encounter the closing curly brace, all the resources that the current uh, block of code has taken are going to, be, to get freed. So if you allocated memory, if you're going to get, uh, it will be freed, obviously, if you use RAI. If you have an STD vector and you have some data inside and you declared it in, in the local scope, as soon as you reach the curly brace, the, all the data that have been consumed by the vector will be automatically free. So no need for garbage collection, etc. But when we say that all resources are freed, we are a little bit stretching the truth. There is one really important resource that will never be freed as soon as you, as you take it, and that's time. 
as soon as you spend time, spend time for something, you will never be able to get it back. So C++ does care about all the resources and does free all the resources apart from time. And in C++, if you wanted to simulate the previous uh, idea of copying the worlds, if you wanted a new world, you would need to actually copy it. So you will spend a lot of, a lot of time to build a new world and copy all the data inside it. And if you don't care about the previous value, you just created a copy and destroyed the old world without any reason to do so. So the idea of trying to do the pure functional programming in C++ can get tricky because if you don't want to change the old values, you always need to perform copies and destroy the old, the old ones. And that's just useless. If we create, if we need to copy all the time, you're just going to lose a lot of time and uh, the performance of our software will greatly suffer. Uh, there was a nice talk at the ACCU or ACU uh, in 2019 by John Lakers, one of the great minds of the C++ community. And he claimed that it's impossible to have efficient functional programming, uh, pure API in C++. And one of the reasons, one of the things that come uh, out of that claim and one of the examples where the API in C++ suffers because uh, it's meant to be as efficient as possible is the std get line function. So std get line accepts two arguments. And when you look, look at it like this, it looks like we forgot to store the, the result of get line anywhere. We just have uh, a C input and we have some S. GetLine is based on the idea that C++ allows us to have input and output function arguments. So this S will be used as a buffer to read the line into. If the buffer is not big enough, it will be expanded, but most of the time it will be uh, big enough because of the law of uh, small numbers. And this will be quite efficient because we don't usually will not, we will not need to allocate any memory, etc. So we are relying on side effects of the get line to optimize something that would be quite problematic to implement if you wanted a normal pure API where get line returns a new string. So side effects are, are usually bad and should be avoided if, if, if possible. But as we said in C++, uh, performance is the priority and the niceness of the API is uh, just not. So it uses in and out parameters and it does have a return value, but it's not what you would expect from a function that, that's called get line. The return value usually ignored is going to be the same as uh, the input stream. So the resulting input stream uh, after the one after one line has been read from it. So the first approach, the first thing that happened in C++ to solve this problem a bit is the introduction of move semantics. So instead of always having to copy something if you want to have a value of some type t, uh, we can now denote that the previous value is not, uh, not needed anymore. So something like uh, the idea from linear types. And instead of copying the whole world, if we know that we don't need the previous one, we can just move it into the new place. So just steal all the data from the previous world, leaving it completely empty and kind of useless. But if we're not going to use it, then it's completely fine. And just steal all the data from the previous instance uh, and move it to, to the new instance and the new value and the new world that we want to use. Now, moves are usually much more uh, performant than, than copies because often when we implement data structures inside, we're going to have a pointer to the actual data. So 
things like std vector which is not optimized for size or anything else uh, it's going to be consisted of a pointer that points to the to the actual array in memory where the data of the std vector are located so instead of then we do the copying we need to allocate the new memory and copy all bytes from the previous vector to the new one in the case of moves we can just say okay the previous instance of the vector now doesn't contain any data and we're just going to set uh, the resulting vector the vector that we moved to we're just going to set its pointer to the data that was previously pointed to by the old instance of the std vector so often uh, moves are just going to be an operate uh, a pointer assignment and nothing else <clears throat> now, uh, this is about optimization, but also move semantics allows to uh, deal with ownership. So unlike most reference counted ownership mechanisms, with move semantics we can uh, create unique owners. And whenever we want to change the owner, we can just say, okay, move the ownership from one value to another. But also, uh, move semantics are quite useful, even if it's not uh, common to talk about this, uh, to document the API without actually writing any documentation and to restrict the usage of certain functions to only movable types. So if you have a function that looks like this, so void foo type ref ref v, this means that this function accepts an instance of uh, type v uh, of type type sorry uh, and it's going to accept only temporary so only the values that we can move from so that we can steal all the data from a special case of this is a member function that is uh, our value ref qualified so in this case this means that we have a class type we have an instance of class type and we can call foo only if that instance of class type is not going to be used afterwards. So again, we can move from the this uh, instead of moving from a normal instance type. <clears throat> we can also return ref ref types, uh, which obviously can be a little bit dangerous because returning references from functions is often problematic. But we will see a bit later how it can improve the performance of our code and how can it be done safely. And if we combine uh, these two, we can have a function foo that accepts a temporary, so something that we can steal from, as an argument. And it again returns something that we can, the, the callee can uh, steal the data from. So let's get back to the std get line. The std get line, we have seen the API. What if you changed it to, yes, uh, to return a refer to, to a string and for its second argument to accept a refer to a string? Now, when we see this API, we clearly see that it accepts an input stream. It accepts some string that it, it will consume. So uh, the string that we don't no longer need. <clears throat> and it's going to return us a reference to a string. So again, a reference to something that we can steal the data from. And then when we call this get line, we can just say our s equals get line of SDC in. And then we pass the previous string and tell it, okay, we are never going to use the previous value, do whatever you want with it. So it can use that strings buffer to read the line into, and it will return us the resulting string, which is quite neat. And the API that we get this way is much more clear uh, of its intent and still as performant as the original std get line. <clears throat> now the question is how to enforce moving with generic programming. In C++, when we write tref ref and t is automatically deduced 
because this is a function template, uh, it doesn't mean that we are going to get a temporary value. So this means tref accepts anything. If we want to say explicitly, we just want movable and move only keys, we need to put some kind of a restriction on T. So since, since C20, we got a feature called concept, which can re restrict the space of keys that are allowed to be used in the function pool uh, to some specific uh, set of types. And uh, the way it's, it's done is by providing a predicate, a compile time predicate, so nothing happens at runtime. A compile time predicate which checks whether T satisfies some requirements. If it does, then we can call foo on it, and otherwise we can't. Now the question is what predicate should we put, put here? And we need to consult the reference collapsing rules. <clears throat> we only want uh, types that are going to be temporaries, so we don't want normal all value, all value references. And as you can see, in most of the cases, uh, when reference collapsing in, is concerned, we're going to, have, to get all value references. The only case where we want is the last one. So if we wanted to check and to make sure that uh, our generic function works only on temporaries, we can just say, okay, T must not be an all value reference. So the T cannot be a normal reference, uh, and this will be uh, a restriction that will say that foo cannot be called on X, it only needs to be called on equity mover X or on a temporary value. <clears throat> now the question is, let, let's see a little bit uh, more examples. Uh, just imagine we want to read from the input string and we want to concatenate everything into a single string. Uh, the way that that would be usually done is just uh, read from an input string sequence and then just append, append, append to the resulting string. And the problem is that, again, using for loops and everything else when we have uh, more advanced concepts like folding, accumulate, reduce, or whatever it's called in your uh, preferred language, uh, we, shouldn't we should never write raw for loops. We should always use higher order parking functions and we should always use higher order abstractions to make our code shorter, more succinct, and more readable. So we could use something like accumulate, the accumulate algorithm, in this case, a little bit modified uh, so that it doesn't accept a pair, two pairs of, uh, a pair of iterators, just accepts an input string sequence and the initial value. By default, it will just call the operator plus to concatenate all the strings. <clears throat> now the problem here is that this will be inefficient. The accumulate uh, is generally implemented uh, like this, at least in uh, older versions of C++. So it will traverse through all the strings in the, in the sequence and always call init plus, uh, so the previous accumulated value plus the current string. This means that we're going to have a lot of temporary strings for each of the operator plus calls we are going to have to allocate a new chunk of memory or the library, this, the standard library you have to do it, to copy the original strings into it. And for each iteration, we are going to generate a new chunk of memory and co copy everything again. Now, in the latest version of C++, that has been a slight change. Instead of init being equal to uh, getting assigned init plus uh, star first. Uh, it's now going to be std move of init plus star first, which means that we are going to tell the library the previous value that is stored in init is no longer needed. Again, use it for whatever you want. <clears throat> this means that instead of having to allocate a new string, if star first can fit in the previous std string buffer, that is already uh, acquired by the init, uh, it will just 
be put in, inside of the same buffer. So we have a really, really big optimization here uh, with each call of the iteration. We are just going to have reallocated memory if the previous buffer is not big enough instead of uh, having to allocate new memory with each and every iteration of the while loop. So the main point is that copying is a performance killer. And we should avoid copying as much as we can. Now the question is, can we enforce linearity? Can we make sure that we never copy by accident? This can be useful when you test your generic functions if you have a function and you don't intend it to copy anything. Test it with read types that are non-copyable. Uh, it is also useful for message passing, reactive programming, reactive streams, ranges, and quite a, quite a few things more. So in C++, if you want to say that something is linear, uh, it needs to be movable, it needs to be uh, not to be copyable, and the moves should be efficient. Now the problem is that we can't really tell whether a move is efficient or not. So we are going to have to use some heuristics. And we're going to say if moves cannot throw exceptions, then we can consider them as efficient. If they cannot throw exceptions, that means that they don't allocate memory or do anything complex. So let's say this, um, you know, this heuristic is going to be, let's say, good, uh, as good as we can, uh, can implement in current C++. <coughs> so, if you want to allow moving, it means that if you have a value of type t, we can use it as a value of type t, which is which should be straightforward. The second, if you have a temporary value of type t, again, we can move the data from that temporary inside our own t and use it as t. We can create a few uh, compile time functions or meta functions, as they're usually called in C++, and say linear usable as t, as t and we can use the t ref ref as t. Uh, how can we define linear usable as? We can just say uh, it needs to be no throw constructible, no throw assignable, and no throw convertible. So t needs to be everything that you already mentioned to u. Uh, then we need to disallow copying, and in order to do so, we can say that a t ref, so an all value reference cannot be seen as t because it will it would require copying the original t, uh, the original value into the new one. The same goes for const t ref and const t. If we wanted to use them as t, it would require us to copy the original value. <clears throat> now we can define that as unusable as and all the things that, that we've seen in, in the uh, previous slide, we can just say, okay, we don't want these to be usable as T. <clears throat> How can we design, uh, define linear unusable as? Uh, we don't want it to be constructible, assignable, or convertible, regardless of whether it throws exceptions or not. So we don't want copying to be enabled even if it throws or even if it doesn't throw. No copying allowed. And the linear concept can be defined as it needs to be not so destructible, uh, which is a, com a common sense thing to, to have on all, all, on all types. Uh, then it needs to be linear usable, which we've already seen, T as T, T referred to T, and none of the copy operations should be allowed. <clears throat> now, if you have uh, things like std unique pointer or std string, uh, we can just restrict the automatic type deduction to work only on linear types. And for unique pointers, it will be okay because they are non-copyable, they're on move only. And it will throw us an error, uh, compile time error, if you try to put an std string inside of the uh, linear concept. If we wanted to restrict our generic functions, we can just say template type in t requires linear of t. Or if you want, if you like the first syntax, 
we can just say that init is a linear type, automatically reduced type, but it needs to be in the concept called linear. So what should we do with nonlinear types? We can just create a linear wrapper, which just deletes all the copy operations and uh, makes the move operations uh, to be default. Okay, let's skip the implementation because it's not that important. Uh, if we want to have a function that gets us the wrapped value, it should be uh, our value reference qualified because if this is a linear wrapper, it can be used only once. So this means that get will be able to be used only once on the instance of linear wrapper. The same goes for the uh, operator star. <clears throat> and we can use our new accumulate, which is restricted only in linear types, to say concatenated underscore ls, so linearly wrapped string. And that will uh, work correctly. So what about the performance? If we call dot append on, uh, on a string, it's going to be uh, an efficient operation. So it will need to allocate memory only if the previous block of memory is not big enough. And if you try to do it with the linear wrapper, we get the same assembly. So the important thing is to note that even if we, are, we have created a class called linear wrapper and it's some kind of abstraction, etc., it's a zero cost abstraction. So uh, changing a variable from string to linear wrapped string is not going to change the performance of our code. Obviously the, uh, the optimizations here are all three. If you lower the optimizations to all one, uh, obviously the code will be much, much slower. <clears throat> now, the question is, uh, in C++ we have something called uh, return value optimization. And it's a really nice feature that when you call a function, you don't really get a temporary and then assign it to your local variable. Uh, it, it means that the result of the function will be constructed directly in your variable when you say fd string equals foo. Uh, foo will construct the result inside of your string without any necessary copies. <clears throat> but the question is whether RVO is good enough. Again, to reference John Lakers. Uh, another thing that he said is that, again, the functional APIs in C++ are impossible because even constructors, even move constructors cost, cost time. So even with the move semantics, things are not going to be uh, efficient enough. So let's see uh, a dirty function called win, and it's just going to append uh, a, value, a string value to, to its uh, string argument, which it gets through a reference. And it's going to be quite efficient calling the same function five times. If you tried to switch it to an API that is more functional-like, it will going to it will get, generate quite uh, quite a few move construction instances and everything else, which is definitely slower. So RBO is good, but it's not good enough. Uh, and if RBO cannot be performed, then we're going to have move constructions or copy constructors. So RBO is the best that we have, and it doesn't always apply. Sometimes we'll have even slower code. <clears throat> so can we achieve the same assembly with something that, is, uh, that has a more functional API? If we create this function bin to accept a refer to string and to return a refer to string, we will get the same, uh, same assembly output as the original dirty implementation of bin, which is quite neat. And again, we have an API that is now more functional-like, so pure, it doesn't have any side effects, uh, and, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> now, the, the problematic part is that we are returning a reference to something, but 
All temporary objects are going to be destroyed as the last step in evaluating a full expression. So it means that all the temporary objects that we've created are essentially going to be destroyed at the semicolon in, in our code that calls a function. So if we do something with, with those resulting reference values uh, on time before that semicolon appears, then we are all safe. If you're going to store that reference and use it afterwards, then obviously we're going to have undefined behavior. <clears throat> so let's check the performance of, or the assembly code generated by using accumulate. If you use uh, the original accumulate without std move, and we pass it a function that returns an std string, you're going to get, to get quite a big chunk of assembly code with a lot of copies without, with a lot of deletions of uh, temporary string buffers, etc., etc. If you introduce the std move, so uh, the new version of std accumulate, <coughs> the code will be optimized quite a bit. You will still have a lot, quite a few move constructors in, uh, constructions inside, or in this case, move assignment operators, but it will be quite, quite more efficient than it used to be. And if we decided that we don't want to return a normal string from a lambda, but a string refrap, and if the standard library uh, used the R value return approach instead of returning a normal value from the operator plus, we would get the code <coughs> that looks like this. So the code that is uh, quite, uh, quite similar to the code that we had when we uh, called concatenation manually by append, append, append. So <clears throat> uh, R value references, move semantics and linear types can allow us to optimize C++ code immensely without losing the functional style of APIs. So my advice is consider returning refs to something be cautious because it might lead to dangling references if you're not careful enough. And to avoid dangling references, store the results of the functions that you call inside normal values. So do not store as a refref or a constrap or anything else. You should always, when you have a chain of functions that return uh, RLE references, you should always uh, store them inside normal uh, values. <clears throat> One of the cases where this is not obvious, but where you have a dangling reference is if foo returns an R value reference and you call a dot value on it, and you use that in a range based for loop. The result of foo will be destroyed before you try to access uh, the dot value, the members of the items, the values inside of the dot value and you're going to have an undefined behavior as soon as uh, the temporary that was returned by foo is destroyed. This can be easily fixed by just assigning the temporary to a proper value, so not a reference, just auto f, and then accessing the, the collection inside of the result as f.value. And a few more advices. Uh, you should always turn on all the error handling, all the warnings and everything else. And you should use static analyzers like client ID that will warn you if you try to use a variable after you moved away from it. And that's it.